My name is Sam and I have rage issues. I am 35, married, and have three children, two boys and one girl, and I adore them to death. Tom, the authorized group counselor, questioned me. Sam, why did the court make you come here today? Well, Tom, this is a long story. I explained, well, Sam, we're all here for the next three hours. Tom said, take as much time as you need. I cleared my voice and began sharing my experience. I will not discuss how I met my wife, but I will tell you, her name is Emily. And at one point, I felt she was the most attractive lady alive. This all started because I attended a stag party. My brother was getting married and we were sending him off with a bang. We went all out with strippers, hookers, and even a naked Candy Graham. After all, he was my little brother. I told Emily every detail of it. I didn't want anything to come back on me. The party was a blast. It began around 3 p.m. It began on Saturday and ended at 7 p.m. Sunday. It finally ended when the cops entered the room due to the loudness. I talked to Emily at least 12 times during the party. My brother married and they left on their honeymoon. It had been three months after the party and things had returned to normal, or so I thought. I got home from work and went to the bathroom for a long shower. I will be the first to confess this. I smelt like ass. I'm a fisherman by trade, but I enjoy working on the docks. I believe this is due to the fact that men may be men. We hang out, talk trash, and work. I was just getting out of the shower when everything went black. It needed to be a vehicle. But how the fuck did it get into my bathroom? I attempted to get up, but for some reason I was unable to move. I looked around and everything was blurry. As my eyes focused, I could only see two persons in front of me. My wife and her sister stood in front of me. Do you want to cheat on me? Emily responded. What the fuck is wrong with you? I said, started to stand up and realized I was duct-tied to the chair. And by duct-taped, I mean it was wrapped around my ankles at least 20 times. I couldn't move one inch. Let me leave right now. Emily said, I said I'd get even with you, you bastard. Get even. What was she talking about? I did not accomplish anything. My brother and I made sure we didn't break any of the rules. They both left. I must have sat for an hour before they returned. Emily entered, followed by five of the males from the stag party. I glanced up and told them to release me. Adam was always one of my oldest pals. I've known him for almost 20 years. He was my best man. I named my son after him. His wife was the only lady in the world I actually trusted aside from my wife. Adam bent down and looked me directly in the eyes, saying, Sam, you shouldn't have cheated on Emily. Before I could react, Emily placed a ball gag into my mouth. Cheat on Emily, that scumbag knew I'd never cheated on Emily. Needless to say, they fucked for three hours straight. She took it up the ass. She was misled. She even had D in each hole. When they were finished, she went into the shower and left me alone with my five ex-friends, Adam explained. Too bad we didn't record it. I just sat there without moving. One of the other guys took off the ball gag. I flexed my jaw and simply gazed at them. Adam approached and stated she was a hot fuck. I've always wanted to fuck her. I couldn't pass up this opportunity. I understand. After this, we will not be friends again, but I simply had to do it. I did not say anything. I just glanced at him and smiled. Adam told Sam, let it go. Because if you don't, somebody will be wounded. He then punched me in the face. With what? I do not know. But I awoke a few hours later in the hospital. I looked over to see Emily sitting in the chair. She must have nodded off. So I attracted the nurse's attention. Could you please phone the cops for me? I asked. The nurse was going to ask why when I showed her my wrists. She said she will be right back. She returned about five minutes later saying they were on their way. Emily had finally awoken by the time the officers arrived. She inquired what was going on. I introduced myself as Sam Wilson. About seven hours ago, my wife had some men tie me up and perform a gangbang in front of me for cheating on her. The only problem, aside from her demonstrating how much of a slut she truly is, is that I never cheated. I can give you the names of everyone there. I know for certain that two of the guys are officers— so if you're not going to do your jobs, leave right now, and after I'm out, I can take them to the state attorney's office. The officer replied, Sir, just tell us what occurred. I told him everything about the party, including the gangbang. Emily simply sat there listening, her mouth open. I informed the police that a videotape of the party had been created to ensure that no spouse got into trouble. I also told him that if one of the guys had sex with a hooker, it would be recorded on tape. 
the officer approached Emily and instructed her to stand. Mother, you have the right to keep silent. She was accused with both assault and kidnapping. I provided them the names of all the males at the gangbang. I said to myself, it's time to deliver the agony. I had been hurt. Now it was time to harm everyone involved. As Emily was carried out, she looked back and told me that this wasn't finished. You are lying, Sam, and I will make you pay. The officer informed her that she was also being charged with making a threat to my person. I had a week-long hospital visit and devised a strategy to bring the agony. I had a lot of licks to collect on. This would do significant harm to a large number of people. So I had to be certain that I truly wanted to get even. So I created a list. First, they admitted me to the hospital. Second, they lied and admitted me to the hospital. Third, they penetrated my wife and hospitalized me. Fourth, my wife is a slut. Assist them in admitting me to the hospital. So much for the list. They can have the slut. Besides, I'm in the hospital. I'm getting even, even if it kills me. What I had intended might actually happen. I stayed in the hospital for the next week, plotting and planning. I left the hospital and headed to the bank. I took out $600 and the teller informed me that my wife had tried to withdraw money. She was upset when she saw that her name was not on any of my accounts. Then she returned with her lawyer and was informed that, despite having a lawyer, her name was not on any of the accounts. They departed angry. I went straight to my brother and inquired whether he knew a decent lawyer. He was angry with me and asked how I could get our friends arrested. As I turned to leave, he rushed out and stopped me. Sam, what the hell is going on? asks my brother. For the following hour, I told him and his wife everything that had happened. They sat there, eyes bulging and mouths wide gaping. When I finished, his wife stared at me and branded me a liar. My brother informed her that I never lie and that she should stay out of it. She told him he didn't know shit and to stop talking. He inquired what was wrong with her if she was on the slut side. Then get the heck out. This is my brother, moron. She gazed at him before getting up and leaving. She went into their bedroom, grabbed her pocketbook, and told him she was leaving. My brother looked her in the eyes and told her to let him explain something clearly to her. If you get involved in this and are not on my brother's side, please let me know. We may get this marriage dissolved since you either support us or not. She gazed at him before walking out the door. We heard the car start. The door opened and she walked in, dropping her wedding ring to the floor. My brother responded, so be it. Then she turned to leave. The first thing we did was go to a lawyer. We set my strategy in motion. By the end of the week, everything would be out of control. Friday's D-Day began with a bang. At nine o'clock, my realtor erected a for sale sign in my front yard, just as Emily was going for work. Emily stepped out of the car and said, what the fuck are you doing? The broker showed her that the owner was putting up documents to show the house for sale. Emily yelled that he couldn't do this. Sure he can. This is his house. Emily's employer arrived at work with a young man who said he was looking for her. The man asked if she was Emily Wilson. Emily said, yes, I am Emily Wilson. He handed her a huge brown envelope and announced, you have been served. Later that day, I received no fewer than 50 calls. Five wives wondered what the hell was going on. I gave each one of them the entire tale. I didn't leave anything out. I received no fewer than 20 death threats. I recorded each of them as they were yelling. I was laughing my ass off. It appeared to irritate them even more. What I'll never get is why, if you fuck a guy's wife and beat him up, wouldn't you expect him to get even? The following day, my attorney delivered five sets of civil cases. I was asking for five million each piece. I sued Emily for bodily harm and theft of private property. My brother just chugged along with me. He had a few run-ins with our supposed friends and family. The trial date for the assault charges was approaching. My brother's wife wanted to discuss, but she'd made her decision. So had he. Adam approached me while I was leaving work the day before the trial. I got out my .38 and shot him in the balls, naturally, by mistake. When the cops arrived, he was yelling that I had tried to kill him. I informed the cops what had transpired. And if they don't believe me, look at the security camera footage. Adam started looking around and noticed that there were cameras all over the place. Adam, you are such a dumb ass, but do not worry. They might be able to reattach your balls. But if they can't, we already know who will be the bitch in jail. In prison, 
there's a man without balls. Boy, you will be really popular. I said. The officer returned with the security recordings and requested to see my gun permit. I took it out and presented it to him. The officer stated I was free to leave. The trial was unquestionably successful. The stag party footage not only proved that I never cheated, it also showed that I called Emily every several hours. Adam and Emily agreed to stand trial together. She knew they'd walk away free and clear. The judge questioned Emily, who told her I cheated, and she replied, Adam. Adam's counsel stated it was a lie. He claimed Emily was a slut and had always wanted Adam to fuck her. Emily sat on the stand, mouth open. Her attorney raised an objection and requested a recess. Emily's attorney approached me and asked me to speak with him for a moment. Sam, I know you despise her right now, but can't you just let her go down in flames? said her lawyer. Why would I assist that bitch? They bound me up and put me in the hospital. And you want me to assist her fucker? I could have died, so let her fry. I said as I walked away. Emily asked if she could speak with me for a second. Sam, I apologize. I know I screwed up. I was very angry. I never believed he'd set me up. Come on, Sam. You are aware that I have a nasty temper. Sam, I know you still love me. Deep down, you love me. So, kindly put your pride aside and aid me, Emily responded. Emily, you have hurt me. I mean, you've truly injured me. I'm going to go against my better judgment and ask the DA take it easy on you, I stated as I left to speak with the district attorney. I smiled and walked over to the district attorney. He bent down by his ear. Please fry this bitch. I looked over at them and gave them a thumbs up. I'd aid her in the same way she helped me while I was chained and beaten down. Now you want my fucking aid. Emily was sentenced to five years. Adam was sentenced to 20 years. When the other guys discovered the severity of the jail sentences, they immediately sought to make deals. Adam's wife, Sharon, approached me after he was convicted. Sam, I understand he harmed you and ruined your marriage, but did you have to do this to us? Ask Sharon. Sharon, I know you're hurting, but they bound me down. Your husband hit me so hard. I spent a week in the hospital. They and Emily abandoned me sitting there, bleeding. I completed the necessary tasks. I wanted to kill all of them. At least now you have something to look forward to. He'll get out someday and you can move on. But I lost my wife, my friends, and some family members. So who has been hurt the most? I turned and walked away. You would believe the narrative ends there, but it doesn't. I'm in anger management class because when Adam was in jail awaiting transportation to prison, I was arrested for drunk driving while serving my 10-day sentence. I kicked his ass as often as I could. I hit him in the face while we were in the recreation room. I struck him with a metal tray. I kicked him. And what was remained in his balls ten times. When I had to face the judge, he stated he understood what I had done. He assessed me a $100 fine and time served over the next four trials. I was able to exact revenge on each and every one of them. Two of them were jumped during a bar fight while the cops were on their way. Somebody happened to have a taser gun. They each applied more than 1,000 volts to the nuts. The final two were defeated by four masked individuals. Funny thing is, I was in Texas visiting my cousin. So I'm sitting here talking stuff with you guys because the court believes I have anger issues. They all sat for a minute before clapping. I couldn't figure out what was happening. Tom stood up and told Sam, You need to learn to go with the flow and not seek revenge. He then glanced at me and shook my hand. Sam, you don't have to worry about losing money throughout your divorce. Adam and the others are in prison. What else could you ask for? Said Tom. Not a single thing I said. During class, I learned that those assholes got off easy. One of the men in the class found his wife cheating and put an axe handle up the guy's ass. Another put a pair of vice grips on his wife's lover's dick and locked it. The person who scared me the most was a doctor. He drugged his wife's lover and injected battery acid into his testicles. They had all served at least five years and, as condition of their parole, were required to attend this seminar. I think the judge is trying to tell me something. My brother's wife has returned home and is doing everything she can to convince him to forgive her. Emily was her best friend, so I told him to try. I informed him that she had chosen our side since she had the opportunity to inform Emily about the plans, but she did not. I'm dating this crazy redhead I met in prison while serving Emily's final divorce papers. It appears that she was there for the same reason. Sharon's divorce from Adam was now final, 
and she invited me out to discuss what Adam asked her to do. Adam appears to have made a few new friends in prison and he wants her to kill me so that he may seek a retrial. So she told him about her scheme of vengeance. Adam, I promise that Sam will pay. I'll make it gradual and long-lasting. He will look into my eyes and know how I feel about what happened, Sharon explained. Adam was an extremely happy man, and Sharon was correct. I was staring into her eyes as she rode me to her second orgasm. I saw just love. Emily writes to me every week inviting me to come talk to her. She realizes she was mistaken. It's simply that she was so angry. She has even gone to a group to discuss her problems. I understand how that feels. How am I feeling now? Pretty darn good. I may be perceived as cruel or a bastard, but this is my tale. While I don't support harsh punishments like burning cheaters alive, I do believe in standing up for oneself. Here is the next story. The gate clicked closed behind me, and I began heading toward my sister's car. I took a deep breath and noticed that the air where I was walking was the same as the air on the other side of the wall, but it smelled fresher and sweeter. Marcy hugged me and asked, Do you want to do anything before I take you home? Is there anything in particular you want to go? Yes, I suppose there is. I'd love to drink a cool beer. You've got it. What is bar? Do it for yourself. You bet. As we drove away from the gray stone walls, I thought about what? Put me there. It was a divorce. It was a really terrible divorce. An occurrence you could never have predicted on that glorious July day as Amy went down the aisle toward me on her father's arm. Amy and I have been together since we were in second grade. No one doubted that they would not marry. We were forever. It was a storybook romance with a supposed fairy tale ending. They lived happily ever after. We resolved to wait until we graduated from college before getting married. We also vowed not to have children until we were 30. We wanted to travel and accomplish things before settling down. It wasn't all about the storybook. Of course, Amy felt the need to know what other boys were like twice, once in 11th grade and again in our sophomore year of college. The period in high school lasted only three weeks. Amy returned and apologized, admitting that her actions were foolish. I dated five men and they were all assholes. I had the finest and I almost ruined everything. I was so preoccupied with school and athletics that I didn't consider going out with other girls. Both times it hurt. But when she did it again in college, I stood back up and told myself, Okay, you want to know about other guys? I'll just go out and see what the other gals are like. I rapidly discovered that many other females were not as demanding as Amy, and that they went down the aisles as virgins in a five-week span. Bev Holbrook relieved me of my virginity. Nancy Newbert introduced me to the joys of B.J. Harlan Collins introduced me to different forms of sex. Pauline French taught me how to do 69. The only flaw was the assumption in the back of my mind that Amy was getting the same education. I recognized double standard thinking, but I still thought that I should have been the one to initiate such activities with Amy. About six weeks after Amy left to discover what other males were like, I returned home from class and found her sitting on the front porch steps. It was a replay of the high school episode. I had the greatest all along and wasn't aware of it. Excuse me, I loved her. I'd been in love with her for what felt like an eternity. So, of course, I forgive her. We never discussed what we had done while apart, but when I tried to have sex with her, she said she wanted to wait until we were married, and I did not push it. Still, it didn't surprise me that she wasn't a virgin. When we win the marriage bed... I didn't say anything, but I could see she was aware that I was not her first. We both found solid positions in our respective industries, and the next four years were very good for me, even if I had to travel occasionally for work. But it wasn't very often, and the excursions were never more than three days. Amy told me about her pregnancy the day after her 26th birthday. I was startled because we had promised to wait until we were 30 to start a family. She told me that her doctor said the medications she took for the virus had rendered her birth control pills ineffective. Nine months later, Brian Lewis joined us. Amy was only off work for six weeks. Her workplace provided a daycare center, so she returned to work and brought Brian with her. Nine months later, she announced that we had started a family. She wanted the next child so they could be close together and easy to raise. I didn't really care, so I said okay. Six weeks later, she told me I was going to be a father again. In her eighth month, she stated that she thought two children were enough. And what? I would mind if she had her tubes tied. My stance was that it was her body, and who was I to tell her she had to spend nine months going about while pregnant? 
A month later, we were blessed with Susan Marie. Amy, like Brian, was only off work for six weeks before returning to work with both babies. Amy and I were both promoted twice during the next six years, and we were earning a decent living. We seemed like the perfect couple. We rarely disagreed about anything, and we remained quite active in the bedroom. We were seeing each other three times a week on average, which I was told was fairly decent when compared to other couples with children who had been married for the same amount of time. We shared similar interests and dislikes, enjoyed going places and doing things together, and were delighted to see each other when we returned home from work every day. But the lovely home life slash loving couple stuff was a fiction. As I discovered one day in July, I had flown to Denver to visit one of our suppliers and figure out why they were having difficulties meeting their delivery deadlines. It was supposed to be a three-day excursion, but when I arrived, I discovered that the IRS had seized the company earlier that day for non-payment of payroll taxes. It turns out that the company has been experiencing financial difficulties for some time. I turned around and returned to the airport, catching the next flight home. It never occurred to me to contact Amy and inform her that I would be returning home early, which was a good thing, since if I had called, I might not have discovered what I did. Amy had not yet returned home from work when I arrived at 5.20 p.m. I considered starting dinner, but instead opted to take Amy and the kids out for dinner. I was in the area we had set up as a home office when I heard the garage door opener begin to run, indicating that Amy was home by the time I went through all of the steps to save my work and then exited the computer application I was in. Amy was entering the house. I had just opened the office door when I heard Amy say, Stop that, in a man's voice. Say, You do not want me to stop it, and you are aware of this. In fact, I don't want to wait till we can get into the bedroom. I believe I want to do you over the back of your couch. Jesus, you have to be the horniest dude I've ever known. Yes, sweetheart. And you adore it? Well, it's kind of nice. Over the back of the sofa. Do I get to remove my panties or will you just push them to the side? Take them off. I almost rubbed my steak raw the last time I shoved it away. We certainly do not want to damage your meat. The talk paused and then, yeah, God. Sure, that feels great. Then there was the sound of flesh smacking flesh, followed by Amy's typical cries and sounds, sounds that made me die inside. I took out my cell phone, sent it to take pictures, and then went into the living room. When I walked in, I knew exactly who I would see. How was Amy's boss at work? I had met him and his wife at Amy's firm. Christmas parties, picnics, and other corporate social gatherings. Amy had no way of knowing I was home. On my way to the airport, I dropped off my car at the dealership for a factory recall on the brakes, which would not be available until the following day. So I had stayed home from the airport. They were going to be startled when I walked in on them. I captured five good photos of them before they noticed I was in the room, then three more as they frantically pulled apart. I slipped my phone into my pocket and proceeded to how he read what I intended to do on my face. Unfortunately, I wasn't standing between him and the door. Fortunately, at least for him, he hadn't pulled off his pants to screw Amy, but had simply unzipped and began with her. As a result, he was able to turn and run for the door before I could reach him. I might have been able to grab him, but Amy stuck out her foot and tripped me. By the time I got my balance, Howe had already left. I turned and walked past Amy into the kitchen, retrieving the phone book from the cupboard where we kept it, and paged through it until I got to Harold. Bathroom. I took up the phone and began entering numbers into it. When Amy entered the room and inquired, What are you doing? I'm calling Janet in the bathroom to inform her of the news. Amy rushed over and grabbed the phone cord from the wall socket. She said, Don't do that. You will just generate issues. You don't believe we don't already have problems? I mean between Hal and Janet. It's good to muck up my life, but I have to be careful not to ruin up his. It is not as if there is no reason to harm Janet. She is the innocent party in this situation. I do not see it that way. She's married to a cheating a-hole, and she should know it. If she accepts, that's fine. But beginning now, I vow to make his life a miserable nightmare. I'll start by informing Janet and offering to show her the images if she wants to see them. Then I'll hire a lawyer and go after him at work. 
I'm sure your organization has a policy and procedure manual, and I'm betting there's something in there regarding a supervisor having sexual contact with a subordinate. And then I'm going to look for him, and when I get him, I'll beat him half to death. You don't want to do any of it because it's too expensive. How do you view this? You go to Janet and she kicks him out. I'll push you out and move him in with me and our kids. You file a lawsuit against our company and I, along with Hal, will be dismissed and without a job. That simply means that I will cheat you out of alimony and child support during the divorce proceedings. Go locate him and bash him up. You will be sentenced to jail for assault. The greatest thing you can do is forget about it all. And we just carry on with our lives. You've got to be kidding. Move on with our life, following what I have just discovered. Why not? Al and I have been hanging out for a long time and it has never hurt us. We have a good life. I've been an excellent wife for you. We get along wonderfully, and I love you. You may screw that a hole and then tell me you adore me. Why not? This is true. For me, this is all about sex. Damned good sex, but only sex. There's nothing like putting insult to injury. When I catch you cheating, you tell me I'm not good in the bedroom. I did not say that. You were not good in the bedroom. So why are you screwing other men? I don't screw other men. I have only been with house since we married. Do you understand what I mean? Look, honey, you are a great guy. You are an excellent husband and father. And you were okay in the bedroom. But Hal gives me something that you can't. Marvelous. Simply marvelous. I'm a great husband and father, but I'm only okay in the bedroom. That is just so good to know. I didn't mean for it to sound that way. There is nothing wrong with you in the bedroom. We have a great sex life. Not good enough, apparently. You are fine, baby. I swear to you that you were just fine. But how? Offers me something I need that you just can't give me. Yeah, and just what would that be? Sighs. How has 11 inches? And those 11 inches do things for me that you just can't do? It shouldn't matter, honey. We've had a perfect life right up until today. There is no reason that we can't continue to have a good life. As long as I don't mind you playing with 11 inches from time to time. It hasn't hurt us, honey, and it has been going on for years. We will be okay, I promise. I just shook my head and said, you were unreal, Amy, just totally out of it, if you think we can continue after what I saw. But I do have to admit to some curiosity. You say it has been going on for years. Just how many years? And how did it start? It started before I met. How it started when I was in college. And we split up because I wanted to see what other guys might be like. One of the first I hooked up with had 10 inches and it drove me wild. Apparently guys with big meat share information in a guy with 10 inches told some other guys about the girl who went wild over his big tool. I went through five of them and loved every bit of what I got from them before I decided that you were the one I needed to be with. That brings up two questions. First, why didn't you marry one of them if you were so hung up on big meat? Because they were all assholes. They all seemed to think that a big tool was all that they needed, and the girls should be grateful that they allowed her the experience. I needed more than a stuffed feeling. And I loved you. So I walked away from them. The second question is why, after you had given up your cherry to a big dig, a hole in drilled several of them for almost six weeks. Did you tell me we couldn't have sex until we got married? I loved you, and I knew I loved you. But I was down on men in general after my experience with the five. I just didn't feel like having sex. It wasn't fair to you. But that was my thinking at the time. Things were fine until one of the company Christmas parties you couldn't make because you were on a business trip to Seattle. I think it was. Anyway, I had a few more drinks than I should have, and I was feeling a little playful when hell danced me under the mistletoe and kissed me. I felt this hard tool poking into my leg. Like I said, I was in a playful mood. So I did a Mae West impression and said, Is that a roll of quarters in your pocket, or are you just glad to be with me? Al said, and remember that he had been drinking also, that it was a lot bigger than a roll of quarters. And I laughed and said, That's what all the guys say. He said, They might say it, but he could prove it. I laughed again and told him to prove it. He did, and I spent the next two nights with him. We hit it hot and heavy until he met and married Janet. We still flirted with each other, but it wasn't until Janet got pregnant and started saying no to sex that we started up again. And then we just never quit again. Honey, it hasn't hurt us a bit. I've got to run over to my sister's and pick up the kids. 
You even have your sister covering for you while you cheat on me. Don't be silly, Rob. She thinks I'm working late. I asked her to watch the kids when they got out of school. They went right from school to her house. And now I have to go get them. When I get back, I'll show you that nothing has changed. I stood there and stared at her in disbelief as she went out to get in her car. Hadn't heard us. Only because I never knew. Going to show me that nothing has changed when she got home. She expected me to take sloppy seconds after her coupling with Hal. Not bloody likely. I plugged the phone back in and called Janet. She was not pleased to hear what I had to say, and she asked me when we could meet so she can see the pictures that I had taken, and we made arrangements to meet for lunch the next day. She asked me not to tell Amy that I had called because Amy would be sure to call Hal and let him know I'm not going to do anything until I have the evidence, and then I'll confront him. I went upstairs and started moving my things out of the bedroom into the guest bedroom. I was hanging my suits up in the closet when a very bad thought came to me. When Amy said that she would kick me out, she had said, he can move in here with me and our kids. It didn't register when she said it, but thinking about it after the fact, it sounded like she was saying the kids were hers. And Hall's. Could it be? I thought back to when she told me that she had started up with how my trip to Seattle had been about a year before she told me she was pregnant with Brian. So how could very well be the father of my kids? God help the both of them. If I found out that he was... I was just putting the last of my things away when Amy came home with the kids. She came looking for me, and when she found me setting up in the guest room, she asked, What are you doing? Putting space between us. Why? I told you that when I got back, I'd show you that nothing has changed. Have you forgotten what I witnessed two hours ago? You expect me to take all sloppy seconds? For Christ's sake, Rob, it has never hurt you before, but... Okay, I'll take a shower first. You just don't get it, do you? I don't want to have anything to do with your cheating, but you are being stupid over this, Rob. I don't love how I love you. I have sex with Hal, but I make love with you. You sure didn't sound like you loved me when you told me you would kick me out and let Hal move in. And I didn't detect a whole lot of love when you were telling me how you were going to screw me in a divorce. I didn't mean it. I just wanted to make you stop and think before calling Janet. Well, I did do some thinking, Amy, and that's why I moved to this bedroom. We are adults, Rob, and we can talk this out and get by it. Nothing has changed. I still love you. Just not enough to keep from hanging horns on me. Just leave me alone, Amy. I left the room and went to see the kids. I helped them with their homework and then played with them until their bedtime. Once they were tucked in, I went into my new bedroom and got ready for bed. I heard the shower running as I turned out the light and thought back to what Amy had said. It has never hurt you before. God, what a stupid, which I was just nodding off when the door opened and Amy came into the room. She got into bed, and I felt her naked body move against me as she tried to grab me. I quickly sat up and pushed her away from me so hard that she fell off the bed and onto the floor. What part of I don't want anything to do with your cheating bum? Didn't you understand? Stay the hell away from me, Amy. Damn it, Rob. I love you. We can work this out. I know we can. No, we can't, Amy. Not a prayer. Now get the hell out of here. She got up off the floor and left the room, and I tried to go to sleep. I had a rotten night and was a bit groggy when I got up in the morning. Amy was up and had breakfast ready, but I just walked past her, got my car keys off of the pegboard, and left the house. I had breakfast at a village inn and then went into work at ten. I called my cooper, a good friend who was also an attorney, and told him my sad story and then asked if I could make an appointment to see him and talk divorce. He told me he would meet me at Bud's Bar at 530. I plugged my cell phone into my computer and transferred all the photos I had taken of Amy and bathroom, and then I printed three sets and put them in envelopes. At noon, I arrived at Mario's and saw that Janet was already there. She rose to meet me and I kissed her cheek and said, I wish we were meeting under happier circumstances. We made small talk until after we ordered, and then I described what happened the previous day. I passed her an envelope with the photos I had taken, and she took them out and looked at them. I was surprised at how calm she was as she went over them. She slid them back into the envelope and said, What are you going to do? Divorce her? There is no hope of repairing things, not after witnessing it with my own eyes. Well, I suppose I'll have to do the same. This isn't the first time his massive gathering has landed him into trouble. I've forgiven him the last time it happened, but warned him that if it happened again, he'd be history.
you may not get the opportunity to kick him out. I'm going to look for him, and when I locate him, I plan to beat him half to death. He could end up in the hospital. You might take all of his belongings and stack them in his hospital room. If you catch him, give him a few kicks in the balls for me. I assured her I would. Then we got up and departed. My conversation with Mike reinforced all I already knew. We lived in a no-fault state, so everything was split 50-50. Amy would get the children and I would wind up paying child support. However, because our wages were almost similar, I would not be required to pay alimony, also known as separate maintenance in our state. I told him I was afraid that the kids were not mine, and he advised me to get a DNA test. I handed him two sets of the images and told him what I wanted. Bartram sued for alienation of affections, and the company where they both worked sued for failing to enforce their CPAP, which said that there must be no fraternization between bosses and subordinates. Are you certain you want to do that? It could cost Amy her job, and you'd most likely have to pay separate maintenance. I don't care, Mike. Simply do it. We talked about a few other topics, and he warned me against moving out of the house and giving her possession. I couldn't throw her out because of the kids, so I should just try to coexist, until the situation with the divorce became clear and the court issued orders. Allow the courts to decide who stays and who goes. However, if there are children involved, the courts in this state generally always rule in favor of the wife. You're in for a hard ride. But are you sure you and Amy can't work it out? Simply look at the photographs. They don't have the sounds I heard when I observed the two of them, but the picture and sound are imprinted on my mind. So I know there's no way we'll be getting back together and working things out. Just start the ball rolling and serve her as quickly as possible. Have her in hell. If possible, service can be provided at work. Amy wasn't smiling when I arrived home. You simply had to do it. We could have worked it out and gotten by, but you simply had to go tell Janet. She kicked him out of the house. Is it all because of you? It's not because of me, Amy, due to what you and he were doing, and I regret that she kicked him out. It will just make it more difficult to discover him. And when I do... I can assure you that that massive meat you fell in love with isn't going to be working so well for a bit. Just remember that I warned you, Rob. That night, I woke up at 3 a.m. when everyone else in the house was asleep and using Q-tips. I swabbed the cheeks of my sleeping kids. I dropped the swabs off at a nearby lab on my way to work and volunteered to pay extra if the tests could be expedited. Something like Amy said, just remember that I warned you. Rob reached out to me, and I was at the bank as the lobby doors opened at 9 a.m. I closed all of the accounts in the safe deposit box and walked down the street to another bank to open an account in my name exclusively. I'd have to account for it later in the divorce, but at the very least, I'd have enough money to pay the mortgage and care for the children. Back at the office, I had another thought and called to cancel all of our joint credit cards so Amy couldn't rack up the balance. Getting a cash advance. It was a good thing I had done all of that because when I arrived home that night, a man approached me, handed me an envelope, and said, You were served, and I would recommend that you move at least 500 feet from this house because there is a temporary restraining order in that envelope. I opened the mail and found a restraining order prohibiting me from coming within 500 feet of the house, Amy, or the children. Her attorney definitely worked far faster than Mike, although I suppose in his defense, he was unaware that speed was required and neither had I. I looked up at the house and saw Amy standing there, smirking at me. I backed the car out of the driveway, drove down to the corner, and called Mike on his phone. I brought him up to date and asked how I could get into the house to get my belongings, and he said he had some contacts in the sheriff's department and would see what he could do and call me back while I was on the phone. I told him to convert the divorce from irreconcilable differences to adultery and to go after bathroom Amy and the bathroom company with a vengeance. Mike, burn them. They were severely burned. He called me back in 15 minutes and told me that two deputies would be there in a half hour to ensure that I gained access to the house, but that until he could speak with someone from the court to make further arrangements, all I could remove from the house were my clothes and toiletries. Twenty minutes later, two cop cars pulled up in front of the house, and I started my car and drove and parked behind them. They introduced themselves and told me to stay where I was until they phoned. They then walked up to the house and rang the doorbell. Amy responded, and after a little conversation, the deputies motioned me forward. They warned me that I could just take clothes and toiletries, 
and then I followed them inside the house. As I walked toward the stairs, I looked into the kitchen to see if the children were present. They were not. But how was it? He was sitting at the kitchen table, a beer in front of him, a beer I had purchased and paid for. It was everything I could do to refrain myself from pursuing him, but it would have been ridiculous to have two deputies there. Amy followed us upstairs and stood in the doorway as I packed. It was childish of me, but I couldn't resist. So I lied and spoke without looking at her. Amy, you blew it. You really messed up this time. I spent the whole of the day at work thinking about us, and I eventually decided that we should sit down and figure things out. After all, you did pledge to love me, Amy. Mental cruelty and a restraining order. Amy, there's no chance for us anymore. Think about it after I go. We were hours away from remaining together. But you messed it up. And now I'm sitting in the kitchen drinking my beer. Put the nail in there. I shut the suitcase, turned, and went out of the house. Amy called me at work the next day, referring to what you said at the house the night before. I would like to sit down and talk to you. Not a chance in hell, Amy. What happened to me yesterday? Plus, sitting in the place you locked me out of ended it and eliminated any chance we had. Besides, I can't sit down and chat to you. You set things up such that I can't go within 500 feet of you. Remember? Hello, Amy. I returned to the house two days later, accompanied by two court officials who would monitor the removal of my belongings. Amy insisted on sitting down and talking with me the entire time I was there, but I ignored her until I was delivering the last load to the U-Haul. We were in the bedroom and she was talking about how we could work it out if I just talked to her. I motioned her over, and when she arrived, I pointed to the master bedroom bath area. When she saw what I was pointing at, her expression sank. On the counter were a man's toiletries, not mine. I didn't use Old Spice or the Minute Speed Stick. Hello, Amy. Just remember that what you're about to face was entirely your fault and might have been prevented. Following that, things moved swiftly. Amy was issued documents at work accusing her of adultery. How was it served? Also at work, he is being sued for alienation of affections. Their employer was sued for failing to enforce the chapter of their policies and procedures manual dealing with relationships between supervisors and subordinates, which resulted in the breakdown of my marriage. Three days later, Hal and Amy were dismissed. Hal, Amy's supervisor, got screwed. However, Amy filed for termination, stating that Hal threatened to fire her if she did not give in to him. Amy hired a lawyer to sue the corporation for wrongful termination when they refused to believe her story. She and Howe must have agreed that Amy's story of what she did was the best course of action, because they were still living in our house during the entire ordeal. Three weeks after I was served, we had a hearing to extend the temporary restraining order, which the judge denied and scolded Amy's counsel for even seeking. A week later, we had the preliminary hearing for the divorce. Mike warned me that things would not go in my favor. They will very definitely give Amy temporary custody of the children and full use of the house until the divorce arrangements are settled. You will also be responsible for making housing payments and paying utility bills. You are also likely to be ordered to pay temporary alimony and child support. Her attorney is also requesting the money you stole out of the accounts, and I'm sure the judge will bring this up. I handed him an envelope and said that this could have an impact on the child support situation. He opened it, read what was inside, and muttered, Shit, Rob, I am so sorry for you. Anyone know who the real father is? I bet Amy spends her life at their house. It may have no influence on this hearing because it is only a preliminary hearing and child protection services will want to confirm the legitimacy of the documents, but it will undoubtedly affect the final decision. Will I get a chance to speak? Yes, but I'd be very cautious about what I said if I were you. It went almost exactly as Mike had predicted. Amy was awarded the house, the children, and interim alimony. I was ordered to pay Amy half of what I had removed from checking and savings, but the other five certificates of deposit were disregarded, and I certainly did not disclose them. Amy's attorney attempted to have the judge order me to pay fees, but Mike protested. This isn't a scenario where my client files for divorce and his wife has to respond. In this case, she sued my client, and he only answered after his wife launched the proceedings. She should be accountable for her own legal fees. The judge ruled in our favor on that one, which made me smile. When the judge ordered child support based on Child Protective Services' advice, 
Mike protested and submitted the DNA test document proving that I was not the children's biological father. I was ordered to pay temporary child support until CPS verifies the papers. If the records are accurate, any support you have paid will be taken from your wife's part of the distribution. I was watching Amy as Mike mentioned the paternity of the children, and she showed no surprise. They knew all along. Finally, the judge questioned if I properly understood the court's directives. I understand what you're saying, but I don't understand why. Why is my adulterous wife permitted custody of the children? It can't be good for them to live with a woman who moved her lover into the house on the same day she sued me for divorce. What type of example does that provide for them? We have just been separated for six weeks and she already has another man in her bed. Also, why should I have to have a house just so the man my three or four-year-old wife cheated on me with has a place to live? The judge just ordered the CPS to investigate my concerns and deliver a report to him within ten days. As we were leaving the courtroom, Amy approached me and asked, How could you do that to your children? They are not mine. Amy and I noticed your expression when Mike brought up the DNA problem. Amy, there's no surprise on your face. There is absolutely no surprise here. You've always known it. Just one more thing I owe you. Yes, right, whatever. Just make sure I have money tomorrow. She walked away. She didn't realize it, but she could suck eggs, at least not in the near future. I felt I could stretch it out for a few weeks before they summoned me to court and threatened me with contempt of court if I did not pay. Even then, I could probably wait another week or two. Mike called me the day after the hearing to inform me that Amy's former company had proposed a settlement. It is on the low side, and I believe we can do better. I'll leave everything up to you because you're the authority on these topics. To be honest, the only reason I sued them was to screw over Amy and Bartram. I was relieved that they were fired. While we're at it, you know, we're not going to get much out of Bartram, especially because he's out of work and whatever little he can scrape together will go to his wife for child support and alimony, so keep pushing and compel him to pay a counsel. If we win, we can obtain a judgment against him, which will always hover over him like a dark cloud. Mike's suggestion of having to pay alimony reminded me that I hadn't spoken with Janet in a while. I called her and inquired how everything was doing. Not well. Things are a little tight because Hal is not working and is not paying what the court ordered. Fortunately, I had emptied the bank accounts before kicking him out. I hate to tell you this, but things are likely to worsen. It turns out that Hal is both of my children's biological father, and he will most likely have to pay Amy child support by the time my divorce is finalized. Maybe not, given they live together. Yes, they are. I didn't realize that. How are things doing with your lawsuit against Hal's old company? I don't have a lawsuit against them. Why should I? I described it to her, and she thanked me for the information, saying she'd have her attorney look into it. Then I said, If I can be of any assistance, please let me know. I hope you're not suggesting what I believe you are. What would that be? Just because Hal screwed your wife does not imply that. You're going to get even. That is a terrible thing to think or say. I'm sorry to have troubled you. I hung up on her. What she said at the end of the call left an unpleasant taste in my mouth and put me in a terrible mood, and I remained in that feeling all day. By the time I got off work, I wanted to hurt someone, and I thought it was time to settle things with Hal, working under the idea that since he was unemployed, he would be looking for work. I planned to take the next day off work, and by 6 a.m., I was parked up the street from the house. At 720 a.m., the kids went for school, and at 8 a.m., I saw Hal's Chevy Blazer drive out of my garage and down the block. I proceeded into a downtown parking garage. I parked three places down from him, got out of my car, and ducked. I was in the elevator with him, and when he reached where I was crouching, I stood up and said, Good morning, Hal. At least it is for me. But I am not sure if it will be for you. He turned and tried to flee, but I caught him, swung him around, and slammed him into one of the concrete support pillars. And then I beat the snot out of him. I finished with six hard kicks to his groin before leaving him whimpering on the concrete floor. It came as no surprise that the next day at work, two officers arrived and arrested me for assault and violence. I sat in jail overnight and was brought before a court the next day. The charges were read and I was asked how I pleaded, and I replied, not guilty. Are you certain that you wish to plead not guilty? Mr. Bartram is confident that you were his assailant. Yes, I stomped his bum but I am not guilty of assault or battery. No, what do you call it then? Seeing that justice was served? 
I don't comprehend how you think. He cheated my wife behind my back for years. He fathered the two children that he and my soon-to-be ex-wife led me to believe were my own. He had to pay for it. That may be. But in this state there is no rule against adultery. That is why I had to pursue justice on my own. The law. I do not care about the law. The legal system fails in circumstances like mine. My wife has been cheating on me for years and has forced me to raise her lover's children. So what do the courts do? They reward her. She gets the house, and I'm required to pay for it and its care. And while I'm doing it, she moves her lover in, and I wind up paying for him to have a place to live. I have to pay her cheating bum alimony, and after the divorce is finalized, she will receive half of everything. She cheats, and the judges award her to the incorrect party. Me gets it cut off in him by the same legal system you were praising. If the law refuses to treat me fairly, I must take matters into my own hands. You still violated the law, and you admit that? No, I'm not. I admit to pursuing the justice that I am owed. I am absolutely willing to let a jury hear my story and decide. You may be willing, but I have no intention of wasting the court's resources by trying the case. You admitted in open court that you, as you phrased it, stomped on him. So I have no choice but to find you guilty and sentence you to six months in the county institution at Fairmont. Thank you. I beg your pardon? You simply helped me achieve justice for my wife. For six months, she will not receive alimony or child support. I won't be making the house payment. And because she was dismissed from her work, she has no money and will be unable to make a house payment. The house will go into foreclosure, and she and her lover will be evicted to the street. And six months in jail means I'll lose my work, so she won't be able to collect any money from me when I'm released. So yeah, thank you. Would you toss away the equity in your home? What is equity? We ripped out the second to install central air conditioning and a swimming pool. If we sold it, we'd make enough money to cover the expenditures and commissions, with a couple of thousand to divide between us. I would rather see her lose even that much. I wouldn't get anything from it anyway. By the time I get out of jail, I'll have nearly six months in back alimony. And I'm confident that your fantastic legal system will ensure that my portion of the proceeds is confiscated and returned to her to cover the arrears. The judge simply shook his head. I served four months in county jail. My father came to see me once a week, and on his third visit, he mentioned that he had received an offer from Amy's previous employer that he thought we should accept. So I urged him to take it, pay the check as soon as he got it, and keep the money somewhere Amy couldn't get to. At the end of my first month, I received a surprise visit. Amy came down to see me while you were in jail. They do not allow just anyone to visit you. You must provide a list of people you are willing to see. And if somebody not on that list comes to see you, they approach you and ask whether you want to see them. Amy was not on my list, but my curiosity led me to agree to see her. I took a seat across from her, the visiting room partition separating us, and Amy grinned and remarked, Orange is not your color. My wardrobe here is somewhat limited. What do you want, Amy? I'd like you to make arrangements for me to receive some money. The housing payment is due with the utility. There must be money to pay bills. I haven't had much luck in seeking work and things are becoming tighter. It is difficult to put food on the table for the kids. So if you were a hall lover and had accepted this beating as punishment for screwing my wife rather than bringing charges against me, I wouldn't be in here and your financial concerns wouldn't be so severe. But he did put me here. So get rid of your money difficulties. When it comes to food on the table for the kids, his children allow him to serve them. How do you say that? True, he was the sperm donor. But you were their father. You were the only father they had ever known. They have no idea how they know he's in our house, and you were screwing him while still married to me. What I'm saying is that you are their father, Robert. You've been there for them since day one, and you adore them to death. Right up until you learn about Hal and me, you can't simply turn that love off, Rob. They did nothing to harm you. Hate me, but don't repeat what I did to them. The difficulty, Amy, is that if I give you money for food, it will not be simply the kids who eat it. I'd feed you and take care of your bathroom needs. I've loved you for too long to ever turn against you and do what I did to Bartram, but it will not distress me in the least to see you both starve. You do not care. We will lose the house if you do not help. Do you mean the house? You've locked me out of the house. You screwed your lover whenever possible. Since you relocated the bathroom inside that house, it has lost any meaning for me. 
Amy, you need to look harder for work. You also need to push the bathroom to the next level. Since he is now the head of your family, he is having difficulty finding work. And what little he comes up with. Janet gets better. At the very least, he has the enormous tool you adored. So it's not a complete loss for you? Rob, that is a laugh. It hasn't worked out so well since you worked him over. Amy, I'm so sorry I messed ruined your life. What do they always say? Life is a witch. I got up and walked away. My sister Megan was my only other regular visitor. She visited once a week, and one of her visits was roughly three weeks following Amy's. She told me that Amy had called and requested her to intercede and persuade me to give her some money. She claims she'll only use it for the children. I think you should do it, Rob. I do not want to watch the children suffer. However, after I am released, I intend to seek full custody, and my only hook is to demonstrate that she is unable to care for children properly and is setting a horrible example for them by living in sin with Bartram. If she is in there with a biological father and cannot even feed them, the courts will have to look into it. The fact that I want kids, even though the bathroom is their sperm donor, demonstrates how much I care about them. Giving her assistance would be counterproductive to my goal. Besides, I don't trust her, therefore I don't care what she says. She stabbed me in the back with a smile for more than six years. So there is no chance I will ever believe anything she says. Are you going to be annoyed with me if I aid them? I'm in jail, Megan. I cannot stop you from doing whatever you want. Megan did aid them, but not financially. She bought clothes for the kids and sent groceries to them around once a week. For Megan, I learned that Amy had finally landed a nice paying job. I also learned from her that things were not going so well in the house. It appears that Bartram gave up hunting for a job because he couldn't find one that suited him. There were positions available, but they appeared to be beneath him or did not pay sufficiently. Megan learned from visits with the kids that Bartram and Amy had a lot of disagreements over him lazing around the house on his buttocks all day. That made me smile big. In my third month, I had another surprise guest. Janet arrived on visiting day. She wasn't on my list of guests, so they asked if I wanted to see her. Curiosity compelled me to say yes, just as Amy had. I remembered our last talk and was curious why she wanted to meet me. When I sat across from her and she said, Orange is so not your color. It seemed like deja vu. I've been told this. What brought you here? Guilt? Guilt? What are you guilty of? They are mistreating you. When was that? The last time we spoke on the phone. I was in a bad mood and disliked men in general. But that was no excuse for what I said to you. I apologized for it. Well, I must admit that it irritated me. However, no real harm was done. Also, I'd like to thank you for one small pleasure you provided me. I provided you a little pleasure. You didn't realize it, but you did. One of my college sorority sisters works as a nurse in our doctor's office. And do you still go to that doctor? Marcia informs me that Hal has visited Dr. Marlin several times to discuss his erectile troubles. It appears that you've done a number on his genitals, and he is having difficulty getting up and staying up. It makes my heart happy to know that he can't use the thing he used to cheat on me with. You might take comfort in knowing that your wife isn't getting any pleasure from what she cheated on you for. It does. Yes, it does. We talked a bit longer before she went, and she made me promise to phone her when I got out. I spent four months in the county jail and was released early due to overcrowding. I qualified since I had already served two-thirds of my sentence and believed I was facing assault, a severe offense. I was not considered a threat to society. When I was released, Mike was ready to give me a ride. He drove me to a motel with weekly rates, where I stayed until I could find an apartment. He kept me up to date on matters. Amy is not fighting the divorce, but she will battle for custody of the children and alimony, and she's going to attempt for child support, even though I don't think she'll get it. Now that you've left, I'll file for a hearing. After then, it will only be a matter of time. Have you decided what you will do with the settlement payment you received from Amy's employer? Just put it out of Amy's grasp until the divorce is finalized. Now that you're out, you can expect to be dragged back into court for the money you were ordered to pay. Amy. Not a big deal. My explanation will be that I couldn't possibly get the money for her while I was locked up. They would say that you might have made arrangements and informed them of where I bank. She was not going to find a way to acquire everything. And considering how much the state's courts favor women, that would most likely aid her. 
Three or four people stabbed me in the back and lied to me for years. I wouldn't trust her not to screw me if she could. The next morning I stopped by work and asked Frank if he had any openings. He told me to get my rump to work and stop bothering him with silly inquiries. That afternoon, I called Amy and told her I wanted to see the kids. She laughed. When I see some money, you may see the children. I hung up with her and contacted Child Protection Services. I told them I wanted to see the kids, but Amy refused. I was told that was her right. If she didn't want me to see them, she could refuse. We reviewed your documentation, and it was correct. You are not a paternal parent. She is also the maternal parent. Thus, she has control. Your visitation rights, if any, will be determined by the courts. So I am not compelled to pay child support. That is also up to the court. You are now required to pay support by court order, so you must appear in court to have it revoked. I believe I can deduce from your attitude that my chances of gaining custody of them are slim. I am not at liberty to divulge what our suggestions to the court may be. I thanked her for her time before hanging up. I called Amy back and told her I'd be over at seven to see the kids and I'd bring money. I won't leave you alone with them. I'll be present during your visit. I went to the bank and took out $500, which I put in an envelope. At exactly 7 o'clock, I rang the doorbell and Amy opened it. I handed her the envelope and she opened it, saw the cash, and moved aside to let me in. I nearly lost it when I came into the living room and found Bartram seated there. I'm not sure what my face said, but he took one glance, stood up, and swiftly exited the room. Brian and Susan sat on the couch looking at me. I hadn't seen them in nearly four months, and I was expecting them to spring up and run to me, yelling, Daddy, Daddy! But they simply sat there. And then Susan delivered the words that landed me in prison. Why did you hurt our father? I assumed I was your father. Mommy explained that you are not our father and that Daddy Hale is. Amy and Sarah smirked at me. I turned away from the children and headed for the door. Amy giggled and said, Hurry back! As I passed her, I took the envelope from her grasp and snarled shut. And you're worthless three out of four. Following that, everything progressed rapidly. I was taken into court and ordered to pay Amy the amount initially awarded, plus back alimony and child support. I informed the judge that I would die before handing over the 304 a penny to the cheater. He threatened to hold me in court if I didn't do it, and I informed him that was the first time he was correct that day. His gavel collapsed, and he announced $500 or 30 days. I took the 30 on the 29th day. I was brought back in front of the judge who inquired if I had revised my position. And I said something. Could you please explain that? I refuse to pay child support or back child support for children who the court knows are not mine. And CPS can back me up on the fact that I am not the kid's father. As for alimony, I am willing to pay it but I refuse to make house payments as long as the woman I am still married to has a lover living with her. I will not pay for a roof over that man's head. Move him out and keep him gone, and I'll cover the mortgage payments. You stated that CPS is aware that you are not the father of the children. Yes, they do. I will extend this hearing until tomorrow, when I may check your statement with CPS. As I was carried out of the courtroom, I noticed Amy's expression. She knew the child support decision would fall in my favor, and she was furious. She was confident that she would be able to stick it to me again. I went back to court the next morning, but the verdict was less than satisfactory. The CPS investigative report revealed that I was not the father of the children and that Howe was living with Amy. The judge overturned the child support order and cut Amy's alimony by a third retroactively. However, I was still required to pay the arrears on each housing payment. Then he stunned everyone, including Amy, by saying that. And as much as Mrs. Ludke has taken in a boarder, she is accountable for all utilities and house insurance. Until that point, I had planned to say screw you and take another 30 days, but I suddenly decided to pay up. My thinking was a little off. Amy was upset about what the judge had done, but seeing me return to jail would cheer her up so I resolved to deny her that. On the other hand, knowing she'd be getting some money from me would cheer her up, even if my payment was a third less than she expected. In addition to no child support and a smile I would offer her as we went, the court would dampen that cheer. The judge ordered that the cash be delivered to the court within 48 hours, or he would issue a bench warrant for my arrest. The smile and sneer I gave Amy as I exited the courtroom seemed to irritate her, which improved my day. 
I was hauled back to jail and processed before heading to a restaurant for a decent lunch. After eating, I went to my sister's to pick up my possessions, which she had retrieved from my motel when I went to jail. We talked for a time, and I mentioned how Amy had indoctrinated the children. Megan told me not to take it personally. They're only kids. And since you weren't there, Amy was the only one who spoke to them. Young children are impressionable. You'll get the chance to speak with them. But I never did. At the final decree hearing, I was knocked back on my heels. Amy was given complete custody, and I was not even granted visits. According to the CPS report, the children's mother and biological father were concerned that I would cause too much disruption in their lives. And since the biological father was going to marry the mother and start a family, the children's best interest would be served by not having me around. The judge then ordered Amy to have use of the family home until the children reach the age of 18, at which point the house may be sold and the revenues split between us. There was an agreement that if Amy married, the house may be sold. The reduced alimony was kept in place, and I was compelled to pay it for three years or until Amy remarried, whichever happened first. I was furious when I exited the courtroom, and as I passed Amy, she smiled and gave me the finger. I stood over it for about a week before I snapped and started making plans. I'll freely admit that I wasn't thinking clearly, but I've been screwed over enough by Amy, and I just lost it. I canceled my homeowner's insurance and started watching the house for an opportunity. Four days after I canceled the insurance, I got a phone call from Amy. The mortgage company called and said you canceled the insurance. I did. You have Hosni so badly that I'm trying to find ways to cut my expenses. I can get a better rate on the same coverage from Allstate. The mortgage company said they need a policy on the house within five days or they will purchase a coverage and bill you for it. The woman I talked to said it would be to our benefit to get the policy in place since the insurance company that they use tends to be quite pricey. I'm on it. Two days after that phone call, I got the opportunity that I have been waiting for. Amy left for work a half hour after the kids left for school, and at 830, Bartram came out of the garage and his blazer and drove off. As soon as he was out of sight, I drove up the garage door and hit the button on the garage door opener. Surprise, surprise, it worked. I drove into the garage and closed the door behind me, taking both of the five-gallon cans of gasoline out of the trunk of the car. I went into the house and asked the inside of the house real good, and then I backed my car out of the garage. I went back into the house and set it on fire. I drove to the airport and parked my car in long-term parking and caught a flight to Panama City. I spent a month lying in the sun and chasing girls. I even caught some of them on my last day in Panama City. I stopped at a bank and rented a safe deposit box and paid for it ten years in advance. I had cleaned out all of my accounts before leaving for Florida, and I put the money into the deposit box. I knew that I would likely be doing some time for what I had done, but I didn't care because I'd screwed Amy royally. She would have lost everything in the fire, and there was no insurance to replace any of it. She would probably come after me to get it, but she couldn't get a dime out of me if I was locked up, and even when I was released, she would play hell, getting even one penny out of me. When I got back to town, I stopped in at the shop to pick up some of my personal things that I left there, and while there I apologized to Frank for leaving him in the lurch. He told me that he understood since he had gone through a pretty bitter divorce himself. Then he asked me if I had it all out of my system and was ready to come back to work. I had to tell him no, that I'd probably be going to jail for a while. He asked why, and I told him. He laughed and said he wished he had the balls to do something like that to his ex. I Mike and invited him to lunch. He met me at Mario's, and when he sat down, he said, You have really stepped into it this time. Everybody wants a piece of your bum. You would have been better off staying wherever it was that you were. The judge took what you did as contempt of court, since he had ordered you to maintain the house. The DEA wants you for a bunch of charges ranging from arson to destruction of private property. Amy wants you nailed to a telephone pole so she can come by two or three times a day and use a bullwhip on you. However, you'd probably be pleased to know that as soon as Amy couldn't keep a roof over his head. How split? How can they make arson stick? It was my house and I didn't defraud the insurance company. In fact, I canceled the insurance so they wouldn't get stuck for anything. The mortgage company is probably pissed because they don't have any collateral on the loan, but I'm still liable for the loan. 
and I sent them this month's payment just last week. As long as I make the payments, they have nothing coming. It was my house. I could do with it what I wanted. In your mind, maybe. But I can assure you that the court will not see it that way. He was right, of course. And after a month of screwing around, I worked out a plea agreement that saw me in the state correctional facility at Albion, serving three years. After serving half your sentence, you became eligible for parole. And when it was offered to me, I turned it down. I didn't want to put myself under the control of the legal system that I'd come to hate and have to go through to do this, or I'll have to send you back, or you can't do that, or you will be violating your parole. I was out in two and a half with time off for good behavior, while in I had regular visits from Mike, my sister, and even Frank, who kept making me promise to come and see him when I got out. Janet even came to see me a couple of times and made me promise to call her when I was free. Also, while I was in, I managed to file for bankruptcy and was able to dump all the judgments against me except for the one from the IRS. It seems that my claiming the interest on the house when I filed my taxes. Yes, boys and girls, even in prison, the IRS requires you to file if you had any income for that year, violated one of their rules since the house didn't actually exist anymore. As Megan and I sat at the table and by its bar and I drank a cold PBR, Megan asked me what was next. Go see Frank and get back to work. Find an apartment and see what I can do to start having some kind of social life. You're going to see the kids? Probably not. Amy did a pretty good job of brainwashing them, and seeing them would involve seeing Amy, and my automatic reflex would be to wrap my fingers around her throat and squeeze. She doesn't want to see you either. He still wants to cut your head off for burning up everything she owned. But she has changed in the last couple of years. She is really sorry for the way things turned out. She really thought she could have her cake and eat it too. She swears she loved you and how it was only sex and you were never supposed to find out about him anyway. She has indicated that she wouldn't be against your having a relationship with Brian and Susan. Well, isn't that big of her? Especially after telling them that I wasn't really their father. Give her some slack, Rob. What she was doing is what you were doing. You were both acting out of spite and the kids were caught in the middle. They have spent several weekends with me, and I can tell you that they miss you. You need to reconnect with them. I don't want to see Amy. If you can arrange with her to pick them up and take them to your place, we can see how it goes. I stopped in and saw Frank, and he told me I could start back whenever I was ready, and I told him to give me a week to get used to being out. I flew down to Panama City and got my money out of the safe deposit box and flew back. I settled up with the IRS, found an apartment, and called Janet and asked her out to dinner. I did reconnect with my kids, and I started seeing them every other weekend. Janet and I dated several times, but it was obvious that all we were ever going to be was friends. I did find a girlfriend, and it looks like I will be seeing I do in the not-too-distant future. She has to be a great person to be willing to saddle herself with two kids just to be with me. Yes, I have the kids now. Amy found a guy and got married, but two years into the marriage, he came home early and caught Amy in bed with another guy. Unfortunately for Amy and her lover, her husband wasn't one to grab a cell phone and take pictures like I did. Hubby grabbed a gun and killed them both. We don't have capital punishment in our state, so we got 20 to life. I sent him a carton of cigarettes every month along with a thank you card. With Amy gone, I petitioned the court for custody and it was granted. And now they are living with me. I guess what they say is true. Thank you for taking time to hear today's story. If you enjoyed this article, Please like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you have a story to tell about your or someone else's situation, please do not hesitate to contact me. Take care.